I'm very excited to start this fall series with Shiwali Moham. Shiwali did her PhD at the University of Michigan with John Laird, and after that, she became a senior member of uh, PARC, uh, Palo Alto Research Center. Um, she is deeply interested in solving problems that require collaboration between humans and AI systems. And what I really like about Shiwali's work is that she heavily inspired uh, her work on social sciences, including cognitive sciences, psycholinguistics, and economics. Uh, so I think she's an amazing interdisciplinary researcher, and I'm really looking forward to the talk. Uh, welcome, Shiwali, and feel free to start. Thank you, Patricia, for inviting me uh, to this colloquium. And thank you, Maya, if she's around, for, for coming up with the great idea of doing it. And I didn't know that this was, I, I get to do the inaugural uh, talk today. So I'm super stoked. Uh, I've always wanted uh, to visit UW. And uh, even though this is just a virtual visit, I'm still very excited. So hi, everyone. Great to uh, virtually meet you all. Uh, today I'm going to talk about robots that talk and learn, and although I've titled this talk as robotics talk, but I am, uh, as a background, as a cognitive systems, cognitive science researcher, so I have a lens that's usually different from how roboticists would look at uh, the problem of human-robot interaction, but hopefully that lens is interesting and you all uh, get to uh, see how a cognitive systems person uh, approaches the problems that they're solving. So, like Everybody, most AI scientists of my generation, I'm very heavily inspired by the depictions of AI in uh, Hollywood. My favorite depiction is Jarvis from Iron Man, who can just extract information from uh, different sources, like you know instruction manuals, and then help uh, Iron Man, um, you know, uh, build new machines. And my my goal is to actually build a Jarvis for myself. So that's why it's. People's fascination with these kinds of depictions of AI is actually very understandable. These AIs are extremely powerful computations, right? These are intelligent collaborators that have independent that are independent and that live for a long time. They have they have their own goals that they try to pursue. They interact and communicate with their humans and they learn constantly from that experience. And as we contrast this depiction of AI, which has people super fascinated with the kinds of AI algorithms we currently see in the popular media, we find that there is a significant difference, right? And, and, and the reason for that difference is, is that design of an AI system, design of an AI collaborator is actually a complex AI systems problem. And a lot of the AI advances, advancements that have been made could be considered algorithmic advances where we are focused on computation, we are focused on you know, efficiency uh, of systems, accuracy of systems. But what we want to move towards is this complex AI system, which is a single system that has all the, a variety of different kinds of intelligent capabilities, right? So it has perception, logical inference, learning, action, language, all of it together into a single system. And it's a, it's a science by itself. Uh, the practitioners of the science, the group is smaller, but it's growing steadily, right? So the robotics, the roboticists are the scientists who are leading this trend, like, because you have to, if you have to design an intelligent robot, you have to think about sensing, you have to think about action control, you have to think about learning all together in a single system. But then I'm finding that a lot of scientists at AAAI, HPI, even some of the very, you know, more computation specific fields like AMAS and ICAP, they're all now slowly trying to build an AI systems research agenda, and which is interesting. So I thought that I'd just quickly go over what does it mean to build an AI system, right? So a complex AI system, right? So this is just a, a picture from introduction to AI. So we have the world, we have an AI system that has its tasks and goals that have been encoded in it. And it's engaged in this perceived decide and act loop in the world, right? It perceives, it senses a certain state in the world, it has certain goals it gets to, it reasons about how it can move progress, how it can make progress towards those goals and then acts about, right? So to make these kinds of AI systems, what's critically important is what you can call a world model, right? We want to learn, understand how do we represent state? We, under, we want to understand how do we represent action? What is the transition function? So if I took an action A in, you know, current, in my current state, what state would result? And then how do I get to evaluate my decisions that am I doing the right thing? Now, this is a very common picture, but what, this is a, 
there's nothing missing here, right? Because this is never going to be the deployment scenario for any AI system. There's almost always a human involved. And basically, no one knows what to do about this human, right? We don't know how to represent the human state, human actions, human decisions, or anything. And this is not just me saying it. Other AI scientists have also brought this to prominence, right? That the AI as a science does not know. We haven't made enough progress in modeling other agents in AI systems so that AI systems can reason with it. And because we haven't done that, 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 that scientific frontier truly exists, we still don't have intelligent collaborators. So this is just, just sort of the main research question that I tried to answer with my research is, is how do we build these intelligent collaborators that are designed to support the goals of a human partner that model, that model the human partner explicitly so you can actually reason about reason computationally reason with those models. And then it has effective performance and collaborative tasks. Right? And I'm going to, because I'm at a robotics colloquium, I'm going to focus on the robotics part of it. But I have looked at other domains right, where this kind of an approach can matter. And uh, if you're interested uh, you know, in, in our one-on-one -on -one later, or maybe in the quest, we can talk about you know, other domains like augmented reality training, um, uh, mobile health, or sustainable communities. All of these problems are actually trying to build these collaborative human assets. So diving deep into uh, the problem called, which, which will be the focus for today's uh, talk is called interactive task learning. Right, so the context is this, that the robocalypse is upon us. Amazon released Astro last week, so now there will be robots everywhere, right? Uh, the, the problem with that is that AI designers cannot really predict all different deployment use cases. The, you, it's very hard to predict all the different ways Amazon Astro or other robots would be used, especially the robots that are designed to be used in unconstrained spaces like home site. What are the different tasks people would want them to do? Um, so one of the solutions to that kind of uh, deployment challenge is that AI should be designed so that non-expert humans can actually program these robotic systems to do the things that they want them to do. And uh, that's why I'm super excited to, give, to be giving this talk there because uh, Maya has been leading this research frontier. She's trying, she's been working on developing methods that allow uh, non-expert humans to program robots. And one of the, su su the success of this research agenda depends on really understanding how would humans want to teach and learn and how would uh, humans want to uh, program robots, right? So there was a forum, it's called Unstrung Strongman Forum in 2017, where researchers from a wide, uh, you know, uh, from different fields came together to define this problem called interactive task learning. And there's a book that came out of it. I'll encourage you to go read it if, if this is uh, something of your interest. So I was uh, privileged enough to participate in that meeting and talk about different aspects of that problem. And so this is, to just really ground the agenda, this is my favorite uh, interactive task learning system. So this is my friend's son, his name is Ishan, and his interactions with his caretaker, Nani uh, Sitsi. So I'll, I'll just let this run for a little bit. Put it on your head. Ooh, good drawing. Try again. On your head, on your head. Put it on your head. Go ahead. Ooh, good try again. Good try, but you're missing your head. You gotta put it here on your head. You wanna try again? You need help? Help? Okay, I can help. Right, so this is what uh, uh, a good interactive task learning system would, would would be like, would behave like, right? And what, what's interesting about this is that this is a teaching, a teacher-learner dyad, right? So it's not just the learner that's special, it's also the teacher, the teacher who adapts the goal that they have to now help the learner actually learn. And they engage in this uh, grounded, concrete interaction about this task where she's trying to teach him how to put the hat on his head. And what I find also very interesting is that the learner is very self-aware, like he can recognize that he's failing and he asks for help, right? So there's a lot of gesturing, she's trying to point out all the helpful information. So this is what an interactive task learning system, as I imagine it to be, would look like, where we think or we study the teacher and the learner dyad, and we are trying to understand the properties of communication between them, and we not just focus on the learner and how they learn, which sometimes computer scientists tend to heavily focus on, but we also understand what is the teacher trying to do. And if we understand how human teachers function, 
then we will be able to exploit that structure, exploit that information to design better learning. Systems. Um, and so that that's sort of sets the pace for my research agenda. I've been working on interactive task learning systems for over a decade now. This work started uh, in 2012 at the University of Michigan where I was a graduate student and I would encourage you to go to uh, the website and look at all the cool robotics research that's been done. It's Rosie trying to learn how to play games. Uh, Rosie tried to uh, learn how to do some navigational tasks and things like that. So I'm going to, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to only focus on a sub part of this research agenda. Uh, and that's the part that we have worked on very recently. And it focuses on trying to understand what does it mean for a robot to have natural language, right? So first I'm going to go into what does it mean for a robot to learn language? And we are working on defining a new problem called embodied language processing. Uh, this work is being done under the DARPA GALA program that came out in 2019 uh, and PARC is a performer on it. Um, so we are working with DARPA to then define this new problem. I'm then going to talk about how humans actually teach, because if we have to design good learners that can learn from human instruction, we first have to learn what is natural for human teachers to teach and how, what is the structure in their teaching. This work was recently presented by Preeti Ramaraj at IEEE uh, Roma. And then I'm going to learn about now we know how humans teach, what does it mean to design a robotic agent that uh, you know, learn from that kind of uh, instruction. And that work was presented last year at Advances in Cognitive. So I should give some disclaimers first. I'm not a roboticist, I'm not a linguist, right? So why, why should you listen to me? You should listen to me because I am a good cognitive scientist. I understand uh, humans pretty well. I understand their decision makings and, um, and how they learn. Uh, so I can bring those insights into the design of AI systems. And sometimes I find that because this is a different perspective, it's a different lens that I look at the problem, I end up in very different spaces than, you know, uh, AI scientist or, or a computational scientist or linguist. Would, right? I want to acknowledge that the foundational research on uh, building language systems for robots was actually done at University of Michigan uh, by Cynthia Matuzek, Luke Zettelmoyer, and Peter Fox. All through my grad school, uh, this is the work I kept on returning back to because this really framed the problem really well. And then there's a caveat that I'm going to make certain assumptions about how these systems are built, but then this is like that any research program, you have to make certain assumptions. But the kinds of assumptions people are willing to make depends on, you know, what problem they're trying to study and what lens they're putting onto the research program. All right, so diving dive deep into what does it mean for a robot to learn? Right, so um, I went, I said, I, in grad school, I started reading a lot of psycholinguistics and this article by Lawrence Forrest Low called Language Comprehension, Archival Memory of Preparedness for Situated Action is the one that, that really inspired me to start looking into this question deeply. And he starts with challenging the current dominant paradigm of studying language, right? He's saying by focusing on language processing as it's derived from storage and retrievals of text, we have basically introduced this bias in the process where we think that language, the primary purpose of language is archival. We are trying to you know, archive information more efficiently and search it more efficiently. But if you really go back and look at evolutionary history of humans, uh, it can be argued that language actually evolved for sophisticated social coordination. So he talks about this task that early humans would be trying to do, right? Like they're creating a team to go hunt the mammoth, who mammoth is a very giant um, animal. And so how would they even communicate? Because a single person cannot kill the mammoth, so you need to have a large team. But how do you coordinate that plan that actually results in successful action? And he is arguing, and other evolutionary theorists would also argue that language evolve to enable that coordination. Right? So we're using language to establish shared beliefs about the environment for describing actions and plans to specify roles in that group so that we all can come together to go kill the map. So if, if we look at the current computational language processing paradigms, they are still have that characteristic in them, right? So the most recent NLP uh, models, like what have you, BERT, GPT-3, they all assume that we are learning language from a whole lot of text, text documents, right? And there the meaning is represented in the patterns of text. The world has been moving slowly towards making it more grounded and concrete. So there are now 
recent advances in grammar language processing where you're seeing that the meaning of language is actually attached to the pictures or videos that may accompany the scene, right? So there's, there have been some phenomenal successes in answering questions like who's wearing glasses given a picture and then you can say, you know, a woman is wearing glasses. The question is, are these representations sufficient for embodied agents? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is this, right? So imagine the agent is this situation that's in panel one. And someone says, move the green sphere onto the red cube. Now the agent can, you know, the picture shows there's a green sphere, the picture shows there's a red cube, but there is no onto relationship between any of these uh, objects. And there is no action information, right? This is what a robot would be faced with. It would be faced with a set of uh, objects, the current state, and it would be asked to do something. Now, in order to understand language, you not only have to understand the current scene, you also have to connect language to what would happen, right? As you executed this action, and then you must instantiate a plan to achieve that, right? So you must identify, okay, the green sphere is this specific object. Let me now try to execute a pickup action with this object. And then I know that the onto relationship means that, you know, they are in a special spatial configuration. So let's to achieve that now I have to execute a put down action on a specific location, right? So that to be able to understand language, the robot actually has to connect it all the way through its perceptions, decision-making and control. And that's, that's the challenge is how do, how do you do that? Um, so the, some of the work that I had done, this is a paper from 2013 that looks at what does it mean, that frames language understanding as a mechanism to guide attention to relevant seen and unseen elements such that the we are able to do useful action. And I also want to highlight this awesome article by Stephanie Chalik that goes, that's a great survey article that talks about all the different approaches that have been taken uh, to design language for robots. All right, so now we have some idea of what is it that humans use language for. We have used that to then define what would it mean for a robot to learn to know language. The second question that I'm interested in is how do humans even learn, right? So human learning and teaching is so common, it's so natural, everyone does it all the time, but we still understand it to a uh, very limited, uh, in, in, in a very limited way. Right? So human learning is not passive. It's not that a whole lot of data is thrown at us and then we get to extract other general patterns from that. It's very interactive. A child is not only interacting with the world, but the child, there's also this interaction that a child has with a caregiving parent. Right? And it's the interesting relationship between the child and the parent that leads to these kinds of, you know, great learning, um, observation. All right, so to understand this, we uh, uh, a graduate student from University of Michigan, Preeti Ramra, she conducted this wonderful study where she had people try to teach a robot that she was pretending to be on how to build a wall using these blocks. Onto the screen. And the goal was that they should be able to build a multicolored wall, right, like a wall that's shown here. Uh, they should be able to teach the robot that. And this was structured like a semi-structured interview where she just said that, you know, she's trying to emulate a robot, but she gave people full flexibility to uh, teach the way they would like to. Um, and here's an example of how they, how one person taught. Okay, let me just start These with again. objects are cubes. I have learned examples of cubes. Okay, um, robot, these objects are green. I have learned examples of green. Robot, this is a wall. I have learned another example of a wall. Robot, the green uh, cone is left of the green cube. I have learned an example of left off. Robot, can you move the green cylinder left of the green cone. Okay, I'm taking control of the mouse. Done. Robot, can you tell me what you've built? This is a green wall. 
robot. This is a red, blue, and green wall. I have learned an example of red, blue, and green wall. Robot, can you make a red, blue, and green wall? Okay, I am taking control of the mouse. All right, we can end here. Uh, I think the last thing is she just puts uh, those objects in that configuration. Right, so this was unconstrained teaching. This is what the participants thought. Uh, the participant just broke down the teaching lesson in, the, in this specific way, right? So, so we saw we uh, had 10 participants uh, in the study, and then we uh, recorded all the session, all the interactions they had with the researcher. And then we did a qualitative data analysis for uh, with that data, where we had a top, a top we did a top-down analysis where we had certain hypotheses about how to do people teach. We validated them with the data. And then through a bottom-up analysis, we expanded our set of hypotheses. All right, so this is a cognitive task analysis technique that focused that the goal of that technique is to then understand how do people approach a problem-solving um, uh, task. Right, so what were our findings? So the findings are very interesting. The primary contribution of this paper is the taxonomy that really tries to identify different components of human teaching. Right, so we found that people broke down a complex task and taught component concepts naturally. So they were not instructed to break down the task. So like the task was to build a wall. They were not asked to break it down, but they naturally broke it down into different concepts. So we show that people thought about, you know, objects, color shapes and sizes, how to refer to different objects, you know, what are the different spatial relationships. So you saw the, um, the participants say what left off looks like, um, how to dif do different actions, right? Um, so we expect that if a learning, if we have to design a good learning system, we, it should be expecting that it will be taught concepts, component concepts separated in time. So you would never get a single action demonstration that just teaches you everything, right? It might be that people talk about different parts of the task at different times. And it's the learner's job to put all of these pieces together in a single task structure. We found that people use a variety of different information in multiple modalities to teach concepts, uh, which then motivates that the learner should have a, you know, a common meaning substrate that they're mapping language, vision, gestures, definitions onto, and that you can, they can use that meaning substrate to then guide their action, right? And what the most interesting finding was the, that there were multiple intentions that were being expressed in, during teaching. And you can think of these intentions as different operations that teacher is doing on the learner. So they're not only just providing, uh, you know, just label data, just informing uh, the robot about the new concept. They are also doing a whole lot of other things. You saw that the participant asked, can you, um, you know, can you move the object in the left of configuration? So she's trying to test the robot if the robot has actually understood that concept. She's trying to figure out the, the boundaries of the robot's competence. And once she figures out that the robot is lagging, then she expands whatever was taught previously. She might want to correct it and things like that. We also saw that um, people specialized or generalized the concept definitions when they realized that robot may not have the right thing. Right? So people are not just providing labels or providing information. It's not a one unidirectional process. It's actually a bidirectional process where people are doing, expressing certain intentions that, you know, elicits the different kinds of information from the learner and they do it because they can adapt to it, right? A teacher, a good teacher will always adapt to the learner. So teachers, so human teachers want to do that. Um, and we also saw that people are flexible, they react to people's failures and successes. Everyone has a very different teaching style and they adopt different curricula. So a good learner actually has to be robust to the different order in which information might be presented. And then we also found, which is a, uh, you know, we were expecting that people bring their background assumptions into teaching. And we realized actually that it was much harder for a, pro a person who had a programming background to teach what they thought was a robot than a person who had no programming background. And I think it's because people with programming background expected to teach the robot as they would write a program, right? So that actually created some conflict in how we had generated us. All right. So I want to 
sort of highlight that interactive task learning is a very different paradigm than machine learning. And it's because the way it's set, and the, the reason for why it's different is because it's set up in a very different way. Like in machine learning, we focus on building a data set, which then an algorithm is operate over and will produce a model. Um, interactive learning is more incremental. There's going to be an experience that's curated by your teacher. And through that experience, you have to extract out generalizable knowledge that you can apply. Machine learning is phased. It's the machine learning engineer or a scientist that decides, okay, now it's the learning time. Let me train on the data set and now it's test time. Interactive learning is all online. The learner is expected to find opportunities, gaps in their own knowledge so that they can drive the interaction in that way. So you have to actually consume information online and then apply it online. Machine learning tends, tends to be passive. You learn only when you are in the training phase. Um, interactive learning is actually active. The learner is actively applying whatever they know onto the task, and when they realize that their knowledge is not complete, they can actually ask for more information, right? We saw, we saw Ishan actually ask for help. Machine learning is big data. That's what, that's what you know, machine learning is uh, framed as these days. Interactive learning is going to be small data by nature because teachers will not give you thousands of examples. They will give you a whole lot of structure. They will give you a whole lot of, you know, um, uh, good ways or good examples of doing a task, but then they will not get a whole lot of samples. Um, data is usually high coverage, but there's only single type of information, right? So like if you are in a supervised setting, you'll only get uh, labels. Teacher is actually giving you a diverse types of information. They are trying to tell you how the task can be broken down into component concepts, what are the different definitions of concepts, what are the different examples. So it's the, the quantity is less, but the diversity of information is higher. So anytime you build a learner, a good learner, you should be able to exploit that diversity. And then eventually these characteristics motivate different kinds of representations. So machine learning, especially the deep learning methods, they focus on distributed uh, representations of knowledge. But because the interactive learning poses certain challenges that have to be online, incremental, active, the representations that they motivate are relational, composable, common substrate representations that you can not, not only use for language understanding, but also use for action. Right, so this is the paradigm that you want to build for. All right, so now the third question, which is the, the thing that I personally get most excited about because of my background in AI systems training, is the question, how can a robot learn language and task concepts jointly? Right, so this is the other thing that, that I didn't get to go into deeper is, is that it's unlikely that a human child learns language separately, vision separately, task separately, and then later puts them together. Actually learning all of these things jointly, right, in a single experience, as the parent is trying to teach about, you know, words that refer to different colors, they're also helping the child recognize different colors. Right? So these, all these things happen jointly in a single interactive framework, right? So you have to, any learning theory that is designed to be working with human teachers, should have similar characteristics. All right, so how do we build these kinds of agents? So to building that, we use cognitive architectures. And uh, I know that neural architectures are the hot term here. Cognitive architectures came even before the neural uh, architectures. And the way to think about them is like their blueprint for generally intelligent behavior. Right? And a cool analogy is that what a von Neumann is to software, cognitive architecture is for intelligent behavior. So without a von Neumann architecture that puts uh, computations in specific structures, it would be very hard to build impressive software. Similarly, if you didn't have good cognitive architectures that put different intelligent computations together in an architecture, you know, it would be hard to build intelligent behaviors. So these are implemented algorithms in a single system. They are, the algorithms are designed using principles of cognitive science and modeling. So the scientists who work on cognitive architectures really take the findings in cognitive psychology, cognitive modeling really seriously, and then try to design computations that are aligned with those findings. Right? And these have been de in development for 40 years, and it's because it's hard. Human cognition is really hard to understand, hard to unpack. And uh, it's, 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 it's been long, but it has been a slow progress. So what have we done? So we, have, we are building a uh, system called Eileen. And that is a end-to-end -end system that is not end-to-end -end neural networks. 
it's actually a design system. The reason we are saying it's end to end is because it has perception, it has decision making, it has action, it has learning, it has language learning, it has concept learning. So we have simplified the domain so the, the agent still works in the block world in a more in a robotic simulation, but we are expanding out the complexity of intelligent reasoning that it's able to do. And what we hope that this kind of a research agenda is that we are able to understand the interfaces between different kinds of you know, intelligent computations that have been developed in the past several decades in AI. All right, so let's some time, spend some time going over what this diagram is. Right, so this is where the workspace is. This is the environment and the agent lives. And it's very hard to see and know but there's a robot, basically it's a tabletop robotic type of a scenario. There's a block over which we place smaller blocks and there's a robotic arm and it can, um, there's a camera though that you don't see, but the camera has a top-down view into the scene. And then the arm can pick objects up and move them around, right? So from the camera, uh, the camera is processed through deep vision algorithms. So we are currently running YOLO on that. So we use that for object detection, but then we are also exploring some other, you know, self-supervised, semi-supervised methods so, so that we don't rely on labels for object detection as much. And it's also extracting like other information like color, shapes, volumes, sizes, what have you. All of that information is then, uh, object detection information is then moved into a qualitative spatial reasoning module. And what it's doing is, and you see examples of these information just in the next slide, but what it's doing is trying to create spatial, understand spatial configurations between objects. So here we know that B is, you know, higher on the, further on the X axis than A is. So it's capturing that continuous information in a more relational symbolic way. So this state information is then sent into source. So SOAR, the way, the best way to understand SOAR is it's a very complex Markov decision process that operates over relational symbolic information. And then it can be used for action planning, it has reinforcement learning and other kinds of AI methods that are built into it. Um, and uh, it, it does some of this reasoning and then it may at some point come out with an action. Um, that you know, I have to put this object in this specific configuration with this other object. That action is then used, compiled down into inverse kinematics and then actually executed in the environment. So this is the internal loop. This is the sense, decide, act loop that the main system operates over. Over this interaction loop is the interaction between the trainer and the learner, right? So the trainer's job, just like how we saw the human trainer, the human uh, study participate, try to teach uh, Preeti, who was acting like a robot, the trainer's job is to curate a set of experiences, right? And then experience is some configuration, some scenario set up in the environment, as well as a content, as well as some linguistic instruction that's provided to the learner, right? So the linguistic instruction would have an intent. So the instructor is trying to verify is asking the learner to verify if there is a green cylinder on the scene, right? And this kind of an intent and content composition can then allow the agent instructor to then do things that we saw human instructors doing, like you have certain operators that you're applying on the learner so that you know more about what they know they don't know, what is the competency uh, of their learned knowledge, and then you're using that knowledge to then adapt what you're teaching. Right, so this is, uh, so this kind of a structure actually enables us to study that. Right, so once you have some linguistic content that goes into lexical parsing and we have an objective rule learning system that can, from, you know, sets of examples of how words are used, can uh, extract grammar from it. Um, and then we have a concept memory. This is um, the memory that's primarily responsible for learning uh, the meaning of the word read, the meaning of uh, you know, moving something from one place to the other. And so I'm just going to go through what this learning would look like in example. I can go through all the computational details, but hopefully there's still interesting things to parse here. Right, so here's the shared environment. And say that the instructor has asked the agent to actually to move the green cube onto the red cube. Oh, by the way, this work is being currently being led by Bill Hadcock, who's a graduate student at Northwestern University. Right, so the, the YOLO system and the other computer vision detector system extract shapes, symbols corresponding to shapes, colors. Um, this is slightly older slides. Now we can also do, you know, continuous variables like size, volume. Um, then uh, 
the system, the qualitative system is also extracting spatial configuration information from this. Right? So now we, it extracts that we know that both these objects are disconnected in space, so they're further apart, and then one object is to the north of the other object. Right? So we, we extract all of this information, and this goes into sort that represents all of this information in what we we'll call a scene graph. Right, so this is a graphical representation. This is what sort of reasons that where each node is you know, a specific information and then the edges relationship between them. So you would have like an edge that represents DC between these two. Right, so now the system starts processing um, the language. So the language is moved the green sphere onto red cube. The system is what I would say is like a white box staged comprehension system. Right, so it picks up each word it tries to look up what does what do I know it to mean, and then it says, can I find that in my scene, right? So um, it basically knows that there's an object reference that be, that's made to green sphere. It knows that there's a noun sphere. So it starts, it asks its concept memory, hey, given my current experience that I have had previously, is there anything that looks like a sphere uh, in my scene? Right. And then the concept memory basically it looks at different parts of the graph. It looks at what its prior experience um, of different spheres are. It creates a match. And if a match is, uh, is higher than a threshold, then it would assert that, yeah, this object is a, a sphere. And again, the way this matching is done is uh, through um, st st structure mapping theory, which was designed uh, with a lot of cognitive modeling experiments where um, Bedre and Ken Forbes from Northwestern they created hypotheses about how is it that humans understand things, um, and then that's, they compile that into a computational theory that's now being used in this architecture. So once, uh, uh, so once the query is successful, the system can assert that there is a green object, uh, sorry, there is a sphere, um, and then it can understand, okay, the sphere must mean this specific object onto the scene. So it guides its attention to that specific object. So as it processes these object references or noun phrases, it's actually guiding its attention. It's highlighting those aspects of its scene to itself so that it knows this is where it has to you know, plan its action. With. Now, what happens when it doesn't know something, right? So say it didn't know what move really means. So first, it will do an abduction. It will try to induce a rule that says that, well, move is usually applied over two different noun phrases. Then it will try to comprehend it. It will try to say, hey, do I know anything in my experience that is the definition of move? And the answer would be that it would usually fail at that moment, right? Because this, it doesn't have any experience. And so what would happen at that moment is it will go from a comprehension space into a learning space. And this is the power of a goal reasoning architecture that's operating over work. That, that's a white box reasoning architecture that it can switch the tasks that it's doing, right? So it was doing the comprehension task, it failed, but it knows what point exactly it failed. It failed when it was trying to process a word. And now it knows that because it was trying to process a word, it fails, it doesn't know that action, which means that it can now start start leveraging its action learning mechanisms and try to prompt the instructor to help it learn actions. And this is sort of what underlies our uh, interactive learning system is this understanding that the learner can recognize its failures, it recognizes why those failures occur, and it can change its behaviors based on where those failures are. Anyway, so we have built the learning by demonstration system. And so what it would happen is it would prompt the instructor to actually do this action in the environment and it extracts a trace of that action execution in the environment and then, then it stores it in its concept memory, right? So say this is the, again, because it's a, if the system learns with graphical relational representations, it will extract that trace and store it in its experience, in its concept memory. But now what, it has, what has it learned at this point is has only learned how to move green spheres onto red cubes because the experience that was given to it was super specific. So it didn't know which parts were important for the representation of the action move versus which parts were just, you know, a statistical aberration just because the scene had red box and green sphere onto it, the instructor just used them, right? So there's no way of knowing just what's in single point. But as we start storing more examples, the stage algorithm actually can uh, 
um, you know, probabilistic reason about what's similar between these graphs and what's different, and then generalize away the parts that are not common, that are not frequent. So in the end, the agent ends up learning, okay, so when I have to move some object onto a specific location, first I have to, you know, get to a state where I'm holding it, then I have to get to a state where it's in a specific Integration, right? So it, it learns that those general representations that it can do use for action. All right, so then well, after building all of this, what do we really have? What we have is what I think is the starting of, you know, the new kinds of AI systems with a neurocognitive architecture. And at the lowest of these points, it has algorithms that are reasoning about very concrete information. It has vision modules that are reasoning about uh, pixels. It has inverse kinematic solvers that are reasoning about control control. But then these are tightly integrated with more abstract representations and more abstract processing, right? So we have a metacognitive goal reasoning architecture that's continuously thinking about what is it that I know, what is it that I don't know, and how do I most make progress in the past. And at the highest level, there is purely conceptual knowledge, right? So there is an abstract definition of what moving means. There's an abstract rule that helps me parse this specific sentence. So we have this single architecture that has multiple diverse representations, but they are all tightly connected to each other, right? So what that allows us to do is to show extreme generalizations. So as long as your analogical reasoning method can figure out how the conceptual knowledge that it has applies to a new situation, the lower part will generalize by default. Right, because they are connected to reasoning that are that is happening at a higher cognitive level, and this is super exciting. Right, it's it's at least it's super exciting to me because this is uh, what I think how a human cognitive system actually functions. We have diverse representations that are all tightly connected together in a single cognitive. Anyways, um, the other part that I was excited about in this project or in this paper at least was coming up with this framework that allows us to evaluate interactive learning. A lot of learning that we evaluate is usually, you know, we report on the accuracy of learned concepts, um, you know, how, how accurately you can label things, how accurately you can you know, generate the labels that are provided to you. But as I said, like it's humans learn interactively, so it's useful to measure how good a system is at interactive learning. So we came up with a new experimental scheme. This is designed after how typical reinforcement learning uh, systems would actually learn and how, you know, their learning curves are usually demonstrated, right? So the way we do it is, uh, the way we set up our learning experiments are, every uh, episode on the x-axis is an informed intention, right? So this is where the instructor will show the agent a green cone and say, hey, this is a green cone. Once the agent is shown green cone, it tries to extract conceptual knowledge out of it, store it in its conceptual memory. Then it's given a set of exams. There are two kinds of exams that we give. One is the generality exam. So the generality exam is we are going to show green cone in a variety of different contexts, and we'll ask the agent, can it recognize it, and can I you know, identify it? The second is a specificity exam, which is um, like, does it, is it learning over general concepts? Right? Does it think every cone is a green cone? And in that way, we will remove the green cone from the scene and we'll still ask, like, do you still see a green cone? So we measure scores for each of those exams and then we report on them. So now here's an interesting uh, sort of behavior that comes out of setting up an experiment like that. So as more examples are seen, uh, the number of examples that it's storing in its memory also reduces. Right? And it's because of this whole metacognitive architecture, metacognitive reasoning about its own learning. It's saying, hey, can I infer green cone given my current knowledge? If I can, then this is not a useful example for me to learn from, so it doesn't store it. But if there are some important differences in what it knows and what the instructor is trying to tell, it then actually shows. So we see the number of examples that the system stores in its memory reduce as you know, its experience uh, increases. And then we see correspondingly its score from the generality exam grows and the specificity exam. Specificity exam, you know, is level continuously. And so this is the um, sort of outcome of the representations that we use. Relational representations typically learn from over-specific, sorry, they learn from specific to general. So it's very hard to get over general concepts with the kinds of representations we use. But we still want to measure it because we don't want concepts sort of bleeding into each other. 
And then the same system can learn visual concepts. So these would be color shape sizes. It would be spatial concepts. These would be configurations like left off, right off, on top of, and then actions, which is actually moving objects. Right, so this is um, sort of where we have been at, and we are greatly expanding the kinds of representations that we can work with, and of course, then making the domain much more complex, which you know would come later. All right, so I had a demonstration, but I'm running out of time, so I will just move on to my next part and just try to sort of go back to this question of why is it that we want to model humans? Why is thinking about humans really important for design of AI? And the answer is this, it's like our AI textbooks taught us that this is how we should be thinking about AI, right? Fully autonomous systems that are going about their day doing certain tasks. Now, I don't think any human lives like that. <laughs> I don't think we are completely autonomous as in that we don't interact with them. And we actually do, and there's an important um, aspect to that we need to collaborate with other humans, we need to learn from them and things like that. Um, and even in the simplest case, this is the interactive task learning case, right? Where we are trying to teach the robot so that we can delegate certain tasks for them. The system must align its representations to how a human thinks about the task, right? Because the human is delegating the task because they want certain things achieved. And if we don't understand what is it that they achieve, how do they think about their world, you won't be able to design an effective robotic system that does the things that humans want it to do. Right, so this system, this picture is incomplete. A more complete picture is a picture that actually takes into account the human that we are designing um, the system for. It has a prescriptive model, a model that allows the agent to evaluate if what it's doing is actually right for the human collaborator. And it has an intelligent algorithm that's reasoning with that model. Right, so these are the systems that I personally really want to build. And I also think that they are the right answer because I don't really think that there would be any deployment of AI systems where humans are absent. And this is just the simplest case where, you know, there's only one human. Often there would be multiple humans who then have to be influenced, who need to be trained, who need to be explained what the AI system is doing. And so the questions about human reasoning are actually central to the design of AI systems. Right. So, we have, you know, this, this is a very cool research agenda and we have shown that you can make progress with this kind of an approach on a variety of different problems. So when I had just joined PARC, I was working on health behavior change. This was AI systems that help people learn healthier habits like eating well or exercising more regularly. And to design such an intelligent coach, right, you have to really understand how humans build new models sorry, new habits, and you have to computationally define those models so that the, the intelligent coaching algorithm can reason with, hey, for this human A, this you know, exercise schedule works better, but for human B, it's a, a different kind. Right? So it's critical to design if, you, if you're building an intelligent code. It's critical to understand how humans learn new habits. Similarly, there was this other project that we did on sustainable transportation where the goal was um, but can you influence people to take more you know, sustainable, more energy efficient modes of transport, right? So you want to encourage people to not drive, but to go take a bus or take a bicycle. But if you really didn't understand that this specific human actually is more likely to bike than they are to take the bus, and you, uh, and you, uh, you know, recommended the bus to them, and you try to influence them to take the bus, that strategy is going to fail, right? And they will revert back to, um, driving, which does not really reduce your uh, energy consumption. So you really have to understand what is it that underlies people's choices, and specifically in this context, more choice. And then there's work that we did in that domain. It's out there published in a variety of different conferences and uh, journals. The current work I'm super excited about as well, we are studying um, robust adaptive behavior for novelty. So if a system is designed or trained with a certain uh, you know, assumptions about the deployment environment, but the deployment environment is very different from what assumptions were made. How does the system recognize that there's something new in the domain? How does it, you know, diagnose itself? How does it then fix itself? And then the other project that I'm currently doing is using an augmented reality system to help people, um, you know, learn new tasks. So that's the inverse interactive task learning where the AI system is trying to teach 
here is new tech. And again, now you have to think about how is it that you need it. So I, the, the kinds of systems that I find super exciting are the systems that have this kind of a human machine collaborative loop there. The system that we're designing actually explicitly models the human in, the, uh, in, in that interaction. All right, so with that, I'm just moving towards the end of my slides. Um, I wanted to, so Park is doing a whole lot of interesting research on AI systems, like move, putting, you know, there's have been so many advancements in AI algorithms and at Park, we are super excited to put these different computation pieces together so that machines can do interesting tasks like di automatic diagnosis of engineered systems like a ship um, or modeling the impact of human behavior on climate. Right? So if you're interested in these kinds of very cool systems projects, Please get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with the right people at Park. With a lot of gratitude, uh, I want to thank all my colleagues and collaborators that have supported my research. Um, a special thanks to all the grad students that have worked with me. They have done phenomenal work. So thank you, Preeti, Will, and Vijay. And with that, this is my final slide. I'll just keep some summary slides up so that people are reminded I talked of about a whole lot of things. Um, but so I'll keep them up and this is it from me. Thank you so much for joining me today. I had fun giving this talk. Thank you so much, Shiwali. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or drop it on the chat and I'll read it for you. Hi, Shiwali, this is Dieter. Um, great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really exciting work. Um, Thank you. I have one question, as far as I recall, also, especially in, in SOAR, um, that there are, um, it seems to be uh, kind of many of the, the rules and things like that and, and triggers in these systems are kind of manually designed. And um, we can see now, of course, that especially for language modeling, right, there's more and more of the just these very large scale pre-trained models that seem to right. capture um, amazingly robust semantics. Um, do you think there's an easy way on the one hand side to incorporate them into, into SOAR? And then also, of course, one big question for roboticists is always, where could we get that kind of language data from on which we can train these models that are adequate for robotics? Because that's often the problem, right? Right, right. So, I mean, so I haven't personally looked in it. You're entirely right. Like down there's this amazing algorithm and a resource that, that we should be looking into using. So I haven't uh really explore the research questions around integrating large language models with something like SOAR. Uh, I have used those language models to design conversational systems that eventually end up, you know, are reasoning about goals and uh, planning and uh, uh, providing instructions to people. Uh, but that is a very, uh, I would say, a superficial connection where I use the large language models to infer intent or content. And then I go from that, you know, intent and content, then drive the reasoning in the sole cognitive architecture. Um, John Laird, I think his recent uh, paper tries to study that connection a little bit more closely. So what would it mean if that language model was a knowledge source and you had to access it during the reasoning cycle? So I could point you uh, to that paper, but the reason I'm saying that is, is like, yeah, the architecture people are studying it. Um, the, the problem that you did describe is, is true though, like how would that data come about, right? So there exists a whole lot of text that humans have written on the internet and that is a really great source to learn those language models. As we move them to the robotic domain, now you have a multimodal data set where you have vision, you have action and you have language. So the, the amount of data was needed to learn GPT-3, you would need exponentially large data to then learn models that eventually lead to action. And that's why, so, I mean, that's one way we could do it. And as, you know, data collection is getting easier, computation is getting cheaper, I'm sure there would be a whole lot of progress in that direction. But that's why working in this more structured design way actually makes sense where we are trying to understand what is it that you humans are using language for. And if they're using language for driving attention and a lot of the uncertainty or a lot of the variation in language use is coming from because um, you know, the, the context that can be used to figure out where to attend to 
uh, is not clear, then if you understand what that context is and build that into a system, you know, it, it can work with a simple language. So I can, I can talk about that a little bit deeper, but I think like there's a tendency to think of all variability in language as this statistical modeling problem that, uh, you know, uh, we need to use these probabilistic reasoning methods with, but a lot of that observable uncertainty in language use is actually coming from the internal cognitive state that we can't observe of mm -hmm. people, right? So the way they're generating, the reason they're generating different ways of referring to the same object is not just because there's a probabilistic process that is arbitrarily saying, okay, with this certainty do X, it's because they are trying to communicate something in a current context. So if there are several green objects in the scene, it's very likely that people will use lengthier descriptions because they are trying to come up with the most salient way to refer to that object to improve efficiency of communication. Uh, but if they are not, then they will just say, oh, the green object, right? So it's all very dependent on what, the pe what people are trying to do and how they're using language for communication. And I think that we can actually model that communicative reasoning um, and we can actually study it and which is what you know this project is trying to unpack that instead of holding everything as a probabilistic, yeah. you know, reasoning method, we are trying to unpack why is this variability even arising and what does it mean for the design of these? Thank you. Carolina, would you like, were you going to ask a question? Yes, Shinami, okay. thank you for your talk. And um, I have a question about the demonstrations. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this demonstration kind of came from verbal or body language, but mm -hmm. my question is, it is usual that these are like positive demonstrations. I mean, sometimes depending on the risk of the task uh, for humans is, um, for a human is more important to show uh, how to not perform a task. Right. Right. Well, you're entirely right. Currently, we have made this strong assumption that all it's learning from is uh, positive examples, and it's trying to generalize away the, you know, the aberrations, and then keeping the parts that are consistent as a conceptual representation um, of a task. A lot of the times, people do express the failure conditions. Um, and again, like we'll have to go back to some of the work um, so I didn't get to talk about it in this talk, but in my, some of my previous work, we have talked about how humans can specifically define the um, successful conditions, how the failure conditions so that the robot can, the agent can search along the right path. But you're entirely right. Like as this agenda makes progress, we do have to think about negative examples. Either the instructor told the robot what the negative examples were, or the robot just through its own experience, right? Like it did something and someone said, well, that was the wrong thing to do. It says it uses that as a way to improve its conceptual understanding. Uh, one of the struggles is that the theory of analogical reasoning and generalization doesn't have a very robust way of handling negative, negative steps, but like we are working towards. That's a good question. Great. Um, so let's thank Shiwali for this amazing talk. Any uh, additional questions, you can reach out to Shiwali via email. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Maya, for inviting me. I had fun. And thank you, everybody who joined. I'm very grateful for you coming and listening to me talk.